All right. So we've started a new quarter um, this month, and I'm actually going to finish up what we were talking about last week. We have one more lesson. We'll go over that today. And then next week, we're going to start a study of the book of Romans. And I hope you'll look forward to that. Romans is a wonderful book to study. I'm looking forward to it, and I hope you will too. Uh, but as I mentioned, we're going to continue on today. By the way, before I start, what do you call a, uh, a sheep with no head or legs? A cloud. Uh, I know, that's a dad joke. I have a better joke than that, though. This morning I heard on the news that in the... Uh, Let's see, the Liberty League track and field championship meet in Troy, New York yesterday. Sadie Schreiner, a man competing with the women, won the women's 200 and 400 meter races at the Liberty League championship meet. He actually broke the 200 meter women's record in the process, conference record. The RT sophomore posted a pair of wins, placing first in the 200 meter and the 400 meter dash. And the 200, he broke a record and the 400 clock to time at 55.07 seconds and route to the second victory. <clears throat> One note, though, the men had a 400-meter race, too, and the last-place finisher of the men's race finished in 53.24 seconds, almost two seconds faster than Sadie. So I told you a joke about a sheep, but that's really the joke today, that a man can run in a race with women and set a conference record. That's the world we live in, is it not? The world that says Christians are stupid. Christians are idiots for believing in a God that they can't see or doesn't hear. Yet we know better, don't we? We know that this world had to be created by a higher being, by a God who loves us so much that he would deliver his word to us, reveal himself to us so we can know who he is, and his word, and not only that, send a son to die for us so we can have forgiveness of our sins and a hope of being with him forever. This world's passing away, man. The stupidity of it, where a man can win a women's race. I mean, I, what's the point, you know? Hey, I beat the girls. Woohoo. Never, you know, 100 years ago, can you imagine that happening? Can you imagine what people hundred years ago would be saying about that? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. What silliness, you know? But that's the world we live in. Well, I want to have a little segue into that, into what our lesson is today. And we've been talking about why I believe certain things, right? Why I believe in Scripture, why I believe in a God, why I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son, why I believe in the Word. And today we're going to culminate this study in our hope our future as Christians, the hope of the second coming of Jesus Christ. The world says we're dumb, we're stupid for believing in that, but I believe there is plenty of evidence to prove that this is going to happen. I believe there's plenty of evidence that Jesus came, he lived among men in the flesh, he died for our sins, he ascended into heaven, and he's coming again. It is a fundamental doctrine of Christian faith, right, that he's going to be coming again, that he's literally going to one day return, just as he came to almost to over 2,000 years ago. He's going to usher in a series of events that will transform our existence, right? The second coming is not to be confused with other comings of the Lord. There have been mention of other comings. The Scripture speaks of more than one coming or day of the Lord. In the Old Testament, God came in judgment against various nations over and over. Of course, he judged Israel over and over, right? Because they would leave him. And then he would judge them. Neighbors would oppress them. They'd cry out to him and come back, asking forgiveness, crying out to God for his, their deliverance. Jesus also spoke of one more, more than one day. In Luke chapter 17, you can read about that. Uh, verse 20, listen, in verse 22, he says, Then he said to his disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. So Jesus spoke about the days. And we know about some of those days, such as is mentioned in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse, when he talked about what was going to happen in the future. And we know that to be that 
in AD 70, when uh, Jerusalem was, when the temple was sacked, when, when uh, Jerusalem was uh, conquered by, by Rome, and all the Jews were dispersed out into the world. The second coming is going to be the last day. It's going to be at the end of time as we know it. Beginning of a totally new existence that will last for eternity. You ever think about that? You ever think about what that's going to be like? Yeah, I know, I know in our lives today we're busy. We, we, we don't think about the future so much, right? We're kind of in the now, right? We don't have time to think about that. We've got too much to take care of. We've got too many mouths to feed, too much work to do. But perhaps we need to sit down and focus on that every once in a while. If you're in prayer every day and you're in, your, in the Word, as you should be, that's something you might want to contemplate. It might give you a little hope especially when you read about stupid things going on in the world, or especially when you read about those people being oppressed because of their faith, people being persecuted. Yeah, that's going on. It happens. Well, why I believe in this? We know from the words of Jesus himself that he's coming back. Turn over to John chapter 14, and let's read what he had to say there. <clears throat> John chapter 14 Beginning in verse 1, he says, <clears throat> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. So I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may, may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Here we have Jesus saying, I'm going away for a little while but I will be coming again, preparing a place for you. So he's telling the disciples, don't worry, be comforted. I'm not leaving you forever. I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to prepare a place for you in heaven. You stay faithful, and I will be coming again. How about from the uh, angels? Turn over to Acts. Let's see what we can read there about the second coming. Acts chapter 1. <clears throat> verse 9 <clears throat> now when he had spoken these things while they watched he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up behold two men stood by them in white apparel who also said men of Galilee why do you stand gazing up into heaven this same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Here we have angels, two men in white apparel, coming to the disciples as they're watching him ascend into heaven and telling him, why are you sitting here? He's going to come again. It's time to get busy. Time to get on with it. This same Jesus who was taken up into heaven will so come in like manner. He's going to return from heaven. So we know that from his angels. Turn over to chapter 3. Let's see what else is said about his second coming. Chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse uh, 17. This is Peter's second sermon. He says, Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Here we have Peter talking about that second coming. Not only that, he talks about the fact that the prophets have been prophesying about this. This has been going on forever. The Old Testament told us about this. And it's going to happen. So he's saying, repent and convert. Be ready. Be converted. Be prepared. Other examples. You don't have to go with me on these, but I'm, I'm going to turn to them. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. Let's see what Paul said about that second coming. <clears throat> Verse 11, uh, chapter 11, and... Uh, Verse 26, this is actually in the Lord's Supper. He says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. So we, heard, we hear that read many times on Sunday morning when we're partaking in the Lord's Supper, right? Did you know that part of the reason you're taking that Lord's Supper is to proclaim his second coming? Yeah, we're remembering his death, remembering what he did for us, Remember that resurrection because that's giving us hope. And also, we are proclaiming the future, the goal to be with him eventually after he comes again. What a glorious thing, right? How about the Thessalonians? Turn on to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 if you want to. And let's read something from there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. beginning in verse 9. <clears throat> For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. Wait, what was that? And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Hmm. Okay, so He's coming. Oh, and there's something else that's going to happen too. It's going to be a wrath to come. Well, what's he talking about there? Well, we might look at that in a minute. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 9. Let's see what else is said about that second coming. Hebrews chapter 9, uh, beginning in verse 27. This is the Hebrew writer saying, And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Oh, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. So he's coming again, and there's going to be a judgment when he comes again. What else do we have? Turn over to 2 Timothy. Let's read another example of something that's written. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verse 1, Paul's writing, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead as his appearing in his kingdom, at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Paul's telling Timothy to be ready, preach the word, get it done because he's coming and there's going to be a judgment. Well, maybe you're saying, well, I know these things, this is coming, but you know, I, I know it. I, I, I've been told. Is it really going to happen? Is it something that we know is going to happen for sure? What, what is going to be the purpose of his coming in? Why does he need to come again? Turn over to John chapter 5, and let's see what he said about that. I know we're jumping around a lot, but I want you to see these verses. <clears throat> if you're ever discussing someone with someone about your faith who doesn't believe, there's some good verses in here to go to, especially when you ask someone, what do you think is going to happen when you die? What do you think is going to happen after you die? They may say, well, I'm just dead. But then you can get on the second coming, your hope, Right? John chapter 5, verse 28. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can't of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. There's going to be coming an hour when all be raised. Everybody, not just those who are Christians, not just those who died in faith, everybody. Those who are raised in faith to everlasting life. Those who are raised in their sins to condemnation. It's really simple, not hard to understand that. It's a bit terrifying. But it also should give us hope as Christians, right? Gives us 
something to look forward to, knowing that when we die, that's not it. And knowing that when our loved ones die or have died, that's not it. They're going to come up out of those graves and live forever. Paul said in Acts 24, there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. Those who are alive, what's going to happen to them? Well, let's turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and see what Paul said about that. First Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50. <clears throat> he says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on corrupt incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible is put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall, then shall be brought to pass the saying it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? So, when he comes again, those who are still alive will be caught up. Paul's writing to the church there because apparently there are some people asking about what's going to happen to those who've already died. I mean, they thought he was coming soon, right? And he's telling them they're going to be raised, and us that are here are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye, sound of that trumpet. Not only that, turn over to 1 Corinthians Thessalonians and see what else is going to happen when he comes to those who are still alive. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse um, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Now I don't know what that's going to be like, but it sounds fantastic doesn't it it sounds glorious it sounds very um joyful and victorious right we made it and we're meeting him in the air what a glorious thing to look forward to when all are made alive it is coming contrary to the view of many you know there's many today and we've studied about the end times in here, right? And those who believe that in what's called premillennialism, that there's gonna, he's going to return and he's going to reign on earth for a thousand years, right? Set up the temple again in Jerusalem, and he'll, Jesus will actually reign there, setting up his kingdom. And thus saying that he has not established his kingdom yet. Thus saying that he came to earth to establish his kingdom with the Jews. They rejected him, went back to heaven, to come another day. But that's not what I or we glean from the Scripture. Turn back over to Acts chapter 2. Let's see what else Peter said here. Beginning in verse uh, 29, Acts 2. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's reigning in his kingdom, folks. Matthew 28, 
Verse 18, before he gives the great commission, he says, All authority has been given unto him. Back in 1 Corinthians 15, let's read something else there earlier in that chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 20. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, but even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to, the God, to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. And when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Here we see Christ is reigning. He will continue to reign until all his enemies have been put under his feet. Notice that's concurrent. It's not in the future. It's now. You see that? I know there's those that will try to say, well, he's really talking about when he returns in that thousand-year reign. I don't believe that. I believe the kingdom was set up on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples, on the apostles, and the church was established there. All authority has been given to him. He's reigning, at, sitting at the right hand of God. First Timothy 6, Paul talks about he's the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So, what's that mean for us? Well, we're in that kingdom. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are receive blessings because of that, right? Forgiveness of sin through His Son. We get to read His Word. We are filled with the Holy Spirit to help us understand things, to help us walk in the light like He is in the light, right? We are in the flesh. This, tough, this world is tough. It's going away. And that kingdom is now upon us. It's not going to be set up when He comes it's going to be, as we just read, delivered up to God. So we as children of God, children of the kingdom, servants of the kingdom, will be caught up with him in the air if we're still alive, be raised out of the grave if we're dead to meet him, and that kingdom will be given to God, that kingdom of heaven. Paul taught this to the Corinthians. Jesus talked about it in his parables. In fact, I want to look at one. Move, turn over to Matthew chapter 13. And we'll look at the parable. This is called the parable of the tares. I want to see what he says here. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 36. <clears throat> says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. So he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man, meaning Jesus. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The son of man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice all of this and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Does this sound like it's something that's going on in the future? No. We are in his kingdom now. He came. He's delivered it. his message. He spread the seed, the good news of the gospel, what he's done for us, and we are part of it. And there's going to be a judgment when he comes. The tares will be thrown in the fire. 
those who are righteous are going to shine like the sun. What a glorious description, right? What a way to look forward to his coming. His kingdom will last until the end of the age. After which, the righteous will shine forth. So, find it hard to believe that the kingdom has not been set up. But what else is he going to come for? Well, we've just been talking about it, to judge the world. Turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Let's see something he said there. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by that same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Hmm. Interesting. Acts chapter 17. Let's see what is said there. Verse um, 31 says, Because he has pointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. So how do we know it's coming? Because Jesus was raised. Not only that, we know who he is by the words that he spoke. And in John 14, in John 12, he says, that's how you're going to be judged, by the words that were spoken. The word of God is what's going to judge you. This we have right here. You're not going to have any excuses. You're not going to have any way of wiggling your way out of it. You're going to be judged by what he said. Those who heard the gospel, trusted in Jesus, obeyed, we're going to shine like the sun. Those whose names are actually written in the book of life, Revelation 20 talks about that. And then, Peter says something else. Chapter 3 there. I should have told you to stay there, actually. Chapter 3 in 2 Peter, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, <clears throat> in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The earth's passing away. You might even say it's passing away now. I mean, the way things are going, right? It's going to be burned up. We're going to be changed. Not sure how that's going to look, what our bodies are going to be like, but we're going to be living in a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. It'll be a realm where righteousness dwells, where we will be blameless. Hmm. That's taught by John. Turn over to Revelation chapter 21. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, 
sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. John's talking about that judgment day when those who have been unfaithful will be judged and talks about that new Jerusalem that will be the place where we all are with God. It's not going to be so much the place. It's going to be the relationship, right? It's going to be that we get to spend eternity with God. Isn't that fabulous? Isn't that fantastic? Or maybe you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? Well, I haven't been on my deathbed yet. I've seen it. It's not pleasant. But I imagine those who have been on it and knew this, it became a comfort for them. Because when you're about to die and you don't have any hope, I can't imagine, that's got to be awful. But if you have that hope that you're going to be with God eternally, it's glorious. I know that sounds crazy. How can that be? But I've seen it. And my only hope is that when it comes that time for me, I can have that comfort as well. We are told that we can have a joy and a peace that surpasses understanding, right? And we have troubles, we have sickness, we have death, we have loss of a job, we have financial struggles, all kinds of things in this world. But this world's passing away. It's only here for a little while. And that hope we have is being with God forever. That should be your focus, right? That should be what you're looking forward to every day. When you wake up in the morning, when you go to bed at night, all that time in between, I want to be with God. And you should realize He's with you now if you're walking in the light. It's going to happen, folks. It's going to happen. We're going to have a new existence, a new body, and we're promised that we're not going to be any sorrow. We're going to be joyful. <clears throat> in, the, in the end, when the second coming comes, it's going to be resurrection of the dead, a transfer of Christ's kingdom to the heavenly kingdom, a judgment of the world and subsequent punishment for evil, a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. If this is not to be, then what's the point? If the dead do not rise, then Christ didn't rise, right? We read that in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul makes that statement. He even says, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is futile, and we are still in our sin. And he says, those who have died already just died. They just perished. He says, if in this life only we have if this, life only, if this life only we have hope, then when the world says we're idiots, that's true. We are the most pitied of all men. But we can have confidence if we believe in God and have that faith, a faith not based on fables, faith based on truth, on evidence, on His Word, We can know that we're going to be with Him forever. If we believe in the Bible as the Word of God, we believe in Jesus Christ, His Son. Because He's not come yet is only an indication of God's long-suffering. Peter talks about that also in the second chapter. Peter also says, but be assured, He's coming. He's promised it. And when God makes a promise, you can bank on it, right? Don't have to worry about it. It's going to happen. 
In fact, we've talked about that. All the prophecies that in the Old Testament, were any of them wrong? No. They were all fulfilled. And the prophecy that he's going to come again is going to be fulfilled. We can bank on it. and We know it. So, what do we do in the meantime? What should our attitude be? Well, Scripture says you need to pray, right? Prayerful preparation, helping you to be ready. Don't want to be like the virgins who still needed the candles lit and all that, right? Door's going to shut at some point. You need to be in there. Prayerful preparation. Philippians 3 talks about a joyful expectation. You know, when I was a little kid and I was told my grandparents were coming for a visit, couldn't wait to get off that bus after school, right? See them there. Because I knew I was going to get some toys and some hugs and stuff, right? That's the kind of expectation he's talking about. We can't wait. Can't sleep at night because God is coming. That's the kind of thing we should be doing. We should have that joy. Not only that, through that joy, we should be patient. We should have endurance. We should run the race and not give up. Hebrews 10 talks about that. To run that race, be there at the end. Don't give up. Because he has certainly not given up on you. So, I hope you enjoyed these series of lessons. I hope it's helped you to know the reasons for your faith and the hope that we have that he's coming again. And if you've never given yourself over to being a Christian, if you've never turned your life over to him, man, why not? That's really the only way to live. That's really the only way to have joy and abundance in this life. Outside of that, we just exist, I guess, for a little bit, and then it's over. If you're not a Christian, I would encourage you to change that today. Or if you're having troubles with your spiritual life, don't hesitate to change it. Do whatever needs to be done to change it. All right, I know I'm preaching now. Time is up. Thanks for being here.